Um, welcome to Friday morning talks on languages and cultures. And our first uh, speaker will talk about challenges encountered when working on Wikimedia projects for endangered languages, as you can see. Our speaker for this morning, I'm honored to invite Carlos Manuel Colina from Venezuela. Is that right? He has been contributed, uh, uh, contributing to several uh, Wikimedia projects, including uh, the uh, Spanish Wikipedia. The Judeo Spanish Wikipedia. Maybe, yeah, I the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Carlos Colina. I'm from Venezuela. And uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges. Uh, I have encountered uh, when contributing on uh, different projects uh, for endangered languages, okay? In two particular cases, Wayunaiki and uh, Judeo-Spanish. I'm gonna explain in the, in the, through the, to the lecture which the languages are and all the challenges. Challenges are common, some are common to, the, to both the languages, some are different because there are two different cases. Okay, so let's, uh, so we get started, okay. First, uh, I'm st um, adjusting to the UNESCO definition on endangered language, okay? And endangered, uh, I'm not gonna read it, okay? I'm just gonna say that uh, a language is endangered when it's in a severe threat of extinction. When uh, there is not enough media, when uh, there are no documents, or uh, less and less people speak it, and it's not passed from one generation to the other, the language over time becomes endangered. And there are, there are several degrees of endangerment. Uh, the thing is that, like he says here, without adequate documentation, a language that is extinct can never be revived. And only, uh, you know, some special cases like uh, Hebrew. I think it's the only, uh, and Cornish, and uh, I don't remember, there's another language which, which uh, has been revived. But apart from that, it, and it takes a big effort. So I think we should uh, focus on helping those endangered languages in uh, reviving and taking them out of the danger. So there are the degrees. This terminology is based on the UNESCO Atlas of uh, Endangered Languages. As you can see, there are three, four, five, six degrees. Safe, like uh, English or French or Hebrew or German which the language is spoken for everybody, and the degrees come from vulnerable to extinct, okay? And uh, these two languages I'm used in the, in the study, uh, they, have, they are in two different stages of endangerment. I'm starting with uh, Wayunaiki, okay? Uh, according to the UNESCO, it's vulnerable. It has around uh, Three, uh, more than 300,000 speakers in 2001. As of now, I would say 400,000 speakers. Out of uh, two million, approximately two million uh, Wayu, uh, people with Wayu heritage. And it's spoken in uh, Northern Colombia and Northern Venezuela. Uh, these are uh, girls in a traditional Wayu costume. It's an indigenous Arawakan language spoken mainly in the northern tip of South America. Uh, it's, uh, so there's something interesting about uh, Wayu. They, when you ask them if they feel Colombian or Venezuelan, they will say first, I'm Wayu. Then, I am Colombian, or then, I'm Venezuelan. And uh, the families are scattered through the border. So there's also been, um, actually most of the trade between Colombia and Venezuela is done by, by Wayus because they have families and relatives across the border. Uh, there's one thing. Approximately less than 1% of the speakers are literate in Wayu language, while 5 to 15% are literate in Spanish. Recently, the Bolivarian government of Venezuela uh, launched a campaign to teach them uh, how to read and write. Uh, and the method is is being given in both Spanish and uh, Wayunaiki. That is because, uh, as you know, in many countries, um, 
Aboriginal speakers are always uh, in the lower classes, which is, uh, it shouldn't be like this, but it's the reality, okay? Then it's the next language we're gonna use, which is Ladino, Judeo-Spanish. Uh, it's called as Judesmo, or Spanyolite, or Sephardi. It's severely endangered, according to the UNESCO. Here it says that uh, less than 400,000 people still have a certain command of, uh, of Judeo-Spanish. I would say less. Uh, I would say 150,000, okay? If I'm going too fast, or please let me know, okay? Judeo Spanish is a Romance language that is the, uh, it was, it's, it developed from the medieval Spanish after the uh, expulsion from, from Spain of the Jews in 1492. Those Jews took their language with them, which was the same one used in Spain, and they moved to the, uh, to the Mediterranean basin. And uh, the language acquired elements from Turkish, from Arabic, from French, from Greek, from uh, Balkanic languages, and also from Hebrew and Aramaic. Now, uh, they're still similar, both languages, Spanish and Judeo-Spanish, but you can tell the difference. Uh, probably reading, you, can, you, you could say, you know, it's very easy to, to read for a native Spanish speaker. But uh, in practice, in, you know, when you hear the sound of the language, it's uh, slightly different. But uh, like many other Jewish languages, like Yiddish, like um, uh, what is the Judeo-Persian languages, Bukhori and all that, Judeo-Spanish is, is severely threatened. Most native speakers are, are, are in their 70s or 80s. And uh, some came to Israel where they became absorbed into the Hebrew mainstream society and uh, they started to lose uh, Judeo-Spanish slowly and the language was not transmitted to their, to their children. And the same thing happened to Latin America, but it was like a dialect leveling because Spanish and Judeo Spanish are very similar. But still, there is a minor revival, uh, especially in music. Singers like uh, Yasmin Levy, Kojava Levy, Sami Levy and the group uh, Sephorad, uh, Smadar Levy, uh, Mor Carbasi. Yeah, all the Levies, yes. All the Levies are singing. Uh, they're singing in several dialects of uh, Judeo-Spanish. And uh, that, is, that has attracted a lot of people, not just in uh, the worldwide jury, but also in, in Spanish-speaking countries. Okay, now we'll talk about the challenges. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenges. A few native speakers of the language, but many of them are elderly. The cases are different, between Wayunaiki and Judeo-Spanish. Because at home, uh, most of the Wayunaiki speakers, you can find them from you know, very old people, 90, more than 90 maybe, to very young kids. They all speak it at home. But that, that's the thing, they only speak it at home. They don't speak it outside in the street. Even though be, if, if they meet in the, in the street, they don't use it. Why don't they use it? Probably for out of shame maybe. Uh, Judeo Spanish is a different case. Approximately 20, 21% speak at a native level, but they are very old. They're in the 80s, 90s. And to get a Wikimedian in their 80s is not easy. I mean, not that they can't, they can actually. Uh, come on, uh, they are, I don't know, how, how do I say this? It's uh, harder to teach them you know, how to use a computer. They're not acquainted with using a computer. Some are, yes, and some are very skillful, very much. But it's not easy to convince a grandma or a grandpa to, to sit on the computer and, and write in Ladino. <laughs> it's not easy, okay? Uh, there's another thing. The language is neither regulated nor standardized, and that's a problem that affects both languages, okay? What you like is mostly oral. Um, there, uh, there is no language regulation, but there is a NGO in Colombia uh, that designed a series of educational books, and they, are, they have uh, seven, eight schools throughout the, the, re the northern Colombia uh, teaching uh, the whole set of education from 
early childhood to high school, and Charlene were you, which is great, and they have these books, but the language is still not regulated. The language is very uniform. There's only like a one mainstream dialect spoken by and understood by everybody, but there's no institution that regulates that set of the rules. Judeo Spanish is a totally different cases. There are probably 17 or, or 18 different dialects. And most are written in a different, uh, with different orthographies. So you can imagine the, like we, like we say in Hebrew, the Balagan. Yeah. Then there is a social diminishing of the language. But uh, Unike is mostly an oral language. Uh, what happens here is that, as it happens in all Latin America, the uh, the Aboriginals are, you know, we are looked at, you know, we're like low class people. They are not. Actually, they were the first ones who arrived to the continent. So. They are the original people of the continent, and uh, many people don't show respect to them. They consider them second-class citizens, and that's, that's really awful. And it has happened that many have chosen to change their, their last names, their family names, to a more Spanish-speaking sounding name. What happens in Judeo-Spanish is that there are different, I'm just saying, 17 different writing systems. You see them all, okay? and. Uh, just imagine to write in a Wikipedia with all those writing systems. So I go and write in a Akiro Shalim orthography, and then uh, somebody comes and corrects it with French orthography. Just imagine, you know, the mess. It can be sometimes. These two, uh, these two centers, uh, the Autoridad Nacional del Ladino promotes uh, Spanish-speaking culture and the language but it's not a language regulator. The same thing in Colombia. They are raising awareness. They're doing a big thing. But uh, in my opinion, there is not enough um, government support. I mean, we are all citizens. Uh, there are Spanish speakers in Israel, part of, this, of, of, the, of the country. We need support. The same in Colombia and Venezuela. Like I said, the marginalization of the group of speakers. Uh, many have changed. Uh, you know, like from Uriana to Rincón, Husayú to Morillo, Epiyú to Semprún, and Uriana to Carrillo. These are the most notable examples. They changed the last names uh, to some more, some standard Venezuelan. Uh, there is a limited availability of uh, printed and online media in the language. In Judeo Spanish, there is. I mean, there is uh, newspapers, magazines, online forums, and communities, and there is even radio. But in Wayunaiki, you'll see. That's the only, the only uh, media available in Wayunaiki. It's monthly and it's available by subscription. And it's written in Spanish and Wayunaiki. Uh, that's a problem all Wikipedians face. New users come and go quickly. What happens? Uh, people get bored. Uh, people don't get motivated enough. Uh, people want to stick to, uh, they don't like to stick to rules. Uh, sometimes we don't attract people the, the way we want. They don't, uh, they don't feel at ease. Or like in Judeo Spanish, you will see different uh, orthographies, and I want to stick with mine. I'm using Moroccan orthography, okay? And I don't want someone from Turkey come to tell me how, to, how do I write the language. His language, his orthography is as correct as mine. But how, we, how do we manage this? So we need to standardize. Again, it comes back to the, the, the other topic. That's what I said before. Uh, the speakers belong to an Aboriginal group. This is very important, the lack of a local chapter. We have contacted um, organizations to help us with us, to, to work with us. There is a group in Venezuela translating 100 years of solitude from Spanish to Wayunaiki, and I contacted them to see if I could find you know, more uh, people to collaborate, to contribute. And the, the first thing they said is, okay, how much is it? And I was like, what? We can't pay, I mean, it's an NGO, we, we don't have funds. No, no, I mean, we, we don't do this for free. I mean, we're being paid for translating the book. So we can't contribute, but uh, give us some money. Again, 
the language speakers are scattered through many countries. So you can imagine how it's hard to coordinate actions between speakers all over those countries that I mentioned in the slide. That happens, I, I can tell you the, the example in Venezuela, speakers are immersed into a dominant language because modern Spanish and Judeo Spanish are mutual, mutually intelligible about 80%, maybe more. So when the immigrants come to Venezuela, they use Spanish, they, stick to, they switch to Spanish and then the language is not, is not passed to the younger generation. Okay, just a few screenshots. The Wayunaki Wikipedia is still the incubator. It, it contains 101 articles, three active users, but none is a native speaker, okay? Most articles are stops or written in a mix of Spanish and Wayunaki, like this one. This is the article of the the greatest uh, Wayunaki writer. The one, uh, he had to learn Spanish to become able to read and write. Judeo Spanish is available since June 2006. 200 and 606 articles, 26 active users out of 5,110. So you can imagine users have come and go. Seven are admins. Uh, some articles are long and complete. Some other are just uh, mere uh, stops. Still, there is a lot of the end of the tunnel. And that there is the media, you know, YouTube, Daily Motion, Google Plus, Facebook, there are forums, communities, and of course, that's where we come. Um, I'm just passing these slides. I can send it over to you if you wanted. Then just helping propagate uh, what you Nike. Uh, probably you have seen her in movies. Uh, the same with NGOs propagating uh, Judeo-Spanish. Uh, okay, now you can make some quick questions, you know, because we have, we're running out of time. Yes? Um, can you give a bit about the writers versus readers? How many people are interested in writing? How many are interested in reading? And uh, do you see either one of these populations growing? Okay. In Judeo-Spanish, you can tell that the dif there is a big difference between reading and writing. Because reading is very similar, since it's very similar to Spanish, probably like relations can be can eight to one, readers versus writers. In Wayunaki, it's almost the same, one to one, because just a few know how to read and write. And most in Venezuela, they work in the construction industry, you know, they're putting blocks. That's what they do. And many do not know how to read and write. Yes? We're working on that. Uh, I have met with another Wikipedian. He's probably here, I don't see him. Ah, he's sitting over there. Um, to help set a script that you can write an article in, like we have a set of four dialects for orthographies, and you can move from one to another. At least the f basic four, you know, the, the, the most used ones, yes? Yes. In the case of Judeo Spanish, it would help a lot because there are 17 different, uh, 17 uh, dialects and spoken by 150,000 people. So when writing becomes, some, it becomes a mess. Because th that's one thing with, uh, with wikis that everybody can contribute. So if you do in your, in your dialect, I can go and change yours. So either we set rules in the wiki, or we standardize the language. Uh, yes?
Okay, uh, the three users of uh, uh, on Wayunaki Wikipedia be also contribute to the Spanish uh, Wikipedia. Uh, you can contact me. I can you know I can pass you the information. We can set up strategies. Great, thanks. Yes. Yes. And for a really an other version and other varieties of of the YMIT language, mm -hmm. has there been any move, let's say, by the ethnic community to try and standardize um, the language that is used on that particular language's Wikipedia? Let's say the same way the Tagalog Wikipedia has tried to do with its language policy, with the language policies that we passed back in 2008, for example. Um, out of these 17, Four or five of the most used ones. The the others are used by hundreds of speakers, hundred to hundred. Uh, so the biggest uh, challenge is the thing is that it's out of a source of pride. You know, I'm not gonna. For instance, let's just make an example. You speak you do Spanish with uh, volcanic orthography, and I use uh, French orthography. They're they're quite different. I don't wanna see it. You know, take. I wanna. I'm, I'm not going to start writing in yours. Because come on, it's mine. It's my heritage. Well, it's, you know, there is a there is a lack of a common uh, goal, which is reviving the language. That we need to work on. We need to work on that. Okay. Um, okay. I'll answer the question later. Um. We might be able to take further questions later on. It depends on the another number of speakers uh, actually arriving. Uh, to this hall at the moment uh, we might have one speaker missing so you might have might be able to take f another question later um, just as a food for thought for later after your fascinating talk I would like to remind us all that um, most human knowledge especially in the global south in, in non all in non written cultures is transmitted orally and th thus once we are capable of using uh, Wikipedia to for instance, store interviews done by those elderly persons that can speak about those, uh, transmit their knowledge only in their own la dialects, only in their own unique languages. That why, why we preserve not only the language, but also the, the knowledge that is stored only in this language. And the uh, tradition and the culture that is uh, passed along with it. Uh, but maybe we should uh, discuss it later on. Our next, next speaker is uh, War Spill Checkers, or Jonathan, and the title of his talk is Cooperation Across Different Wikipedia Languages, The Death Anomalies, Anomaly, Anomalies Case Study. Coming from London, here is Jonathan. I don't need, it's okay, it's okay, I just need this. No, 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 no. Can everyone hear me? Okay, is everyone awake? Right. Um, so, the, uh, the death anomalies case study, the, the, the problem that, um, that I, I thought about a year ago when this started, just over a year ago, was um, just on the English Wikipedia, and I'll get on to a bunch of other ones in a minute, but just on the English Wikipedia, we have half a million biographies of living people um, who we consider to be living, but we're not entirely sure in some cases. Um, and I predict, confidently predict, that a very high proportion of these will need to be updated in the next 100 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> and um, not all of these will be covered in the English language um, media. And I've been talking here with people, I was talking to somebody from Slovakia who who checks the, the, the local papers, the, 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 Slovak, sorry, the Slovakian national papers um, all the time, and he looks at the obituaries that are coming up in Slovakia, but the same issue will be coming up that somebody who was famous for winning an Olympic medal 60 years ago, who now dies, um, they're probably only going to get covered in the, in the newspapers in the country they live in. Yep. So there's a general issue here that, that uh, and, uh, we want to make sure that our information is accurate. 
we know that these things are, are going to change. And having an encyclopedia article that, that says somebody is living and says somebody is now 86, when actually they died when 20 years ago, when they were 66, is really not too clever and not too good. And I was, I was worried that we probably had, I thought we would have thousands of anomalies on this. Um, so um, back in June last year, I, I put a bot request in um, to, to create a bot that would look at the intra-wiki links, look across the different languages of Wikipedia, and, and say, who are the people on my language wiki who are dead according to another language wiki and produce a report that we could then look at? And I thought that there would be thousands on there. Um, and a chap called Melissa Mo went off and wrote it, launched it on the German Wikipedia. So this started actually off on the German Wikipedia, got here first, um, and then produced a report for me on the English Wikipedia. And there were 600 and something anomalies. So it was much smaller than I thought. We have a, we have a problem, we have an opportunity to improve, but actually it's not quite as bad as, as, as maybe I thought. Um, since then it's grown and um, it now runs on, on uh, there are 10 different languages uh, of, of ling language Wikipedias which are extracting reports. Um, the last couple of months have seen the, the Russians amongst others join it. And the Russians, the first report they had was over 700 articles, I believe. And last a uh, few days ago, they had it down to four. So uh, we can have a clap for, for the Russians, even if, I don't know if the individuals here are the ones who've done this, but uh, there has been some great work that's been done on that. Um, so the, the issues that it, that, that it comes up with um, are partly, uh, mostly, somebody who's, who's a living according to your Wikipedia, they're dead according to somewhere else, and yes, it is the same person, and yes, they are dead, and usually, um, usually you can actually go to the, the other one, the Italian or the German one, look at their, their thing, say it's the same person, copy the reference that they're using, click on the reference and, and, and look at it, copy that reference, go back to your language, update the article, say that they're, they're dead, make a few changes, etc., and it's done. It's as easy as that. Um, though it's, it's actually very straightforward to do these things in the majority of occasions. There's a minority of these where you look at these things and you say, um, actually, this is a completely different person. Occasionally, not very often, but occasionally, we've got the intra wiki links wrong. And, um, and you then wind up going across multiple languages, as I sometimes do, and you find that we've got five people where, five, five languages where we have a biography of a 19th century German composer, and three languages where we have a biography of a 20th stroke, 21st century American baseball star. They happen to have the same name, and according to the intra wiki links, they're actually the same person. So, <laughs> um, in order to fix the intra wiki links, if anyone's ever fixed an intra wiki link, it took me a, a couple of attempts before I realized you have to then go to all eight articles and take off the, split them into, effectively into two groups, take off all the unnecessary intra wiki links, because if you leave one, the bots will come back in and they'll repopulate the thing. And I, and I saw one article recently, I was splitting one of these apart, and I was on. Um, now, I won't say what language Wikipedia I was on, but I was on a particular language Wikipedia looking at that, and I saw the edit history of this particular article mainly seemed to consist of somebody taking off an incorrect intra wiki link and a bot putting it back in again, <laughs> and then it goes back. And that was half the edits on that particular one. And because I'd taken it off all the other ones, so I took it off that, it, it, it hasn't come back on there again. Um, so what have we achieved with, with this? Um, with the, the 10 languages that we've introduced this in, um, and, and actually going beyond that, I've now, I now have edits in more than 20 different languages. I'm a fully qualified Englishman. I only speak one. <laughs> I can order a beer in about five or six other different languages, but I've edits now in more than 20. Most of those edits are simply taking off an intra wiki link. Um, I went to the Latin Wikipedia um, a few months ago where we had a, an article on a, a, a teenage um, movie starlet on English and according to the link, according to the report, uh, this girl was, had, an article, had a, a biography on the Latin Wikipedia and she was dead. 
Um, and I went to that and I looked and it's the same, it's obviously the same article, I speak six words of Latin or something, but it's obvious, it's the same picture, uh, it's the same structure, it's fairly obvious translation. Um, it turned out, same category of, of um, born in 1993, but the person who had originally written it, probably I suspect as translation homework, um, had also put in the category died in 1991. So that was, a, that was a fairly obvious one. I didn't need to check for sources and so on that. I just took that off with a slightly apologetic summary and apologizing that I was editing in English and etc. and hoping I got it right. Um, and I've now left user pages scattered across 20 different languages with a link to the English one saying apologies for intrusion in the wrong language and I will just occasionally fix interwiki links etc. And occasionally it is a case of, of the anomalies that are coming up are, um, are a category error, an intrawiki error, et cetera. But the bulk of the ones that are coming up are what we originally were, were, were expecting, the smaller numbers, people who are living in your wiki and, um, and are dead in, in various other ones, and they're dead in real life. Yeah? So well, we're, we're, they're dead according to reliable sources. And occasionally primary sources. But primary sources, I figure, are kind of okay if the if the artist's website, etc., is referring them to them as having died six weeks ago. That's probably good enough for what we're doing on this. Um, so the opportunity um, uh, is big because we've only at the moment got this running in ten languages. Um, we actually now have eighty languages where we have the the, the categories um, set up and in the report. So the 10 languages that um, are, use, are getting these reports um, are getting anomalies across not any of the other nine, um, but 70 other languages. Um, and any of those 70 could request a report and within days that report will appear, within a day or two. Um, and the other um, 190 languages, well, one of the problems we have is that there are differences between different pedias. And I know that Dutch and some other languages don't have categories such as living people. And this works by looking at the category living people um, and, and saying if you're in that category and you've got intrawiki links, well, we've all got intrawiki links, that at least is one commonality, um, and you, have, um, you don't have the category of, of died in a particular year, which goes into the dead people category, then it can produce this report. But there are some uh, Wikipedias that have chosen not to have that. Um, I think the Finnish was, the, Finland was the one, or the Finnish Wikipedia was the one where they decided, actually, um, we will, in order to use this report, we will add these categories, and they did, and, and Finland is now, Finnish Wikipedia is now one of the ones that gets the report and, and makes these changes. Um, across English and Russian and Norwegian and various other ones, there have now been thousands of articles that have been improved. Most of these, I admit, are very minor, relatively minor improvements. Some of them are actually really, really major. And it's not just the 10 languages. I fixed vandalism on the Italian Wikipedia um, for now. And there, uh, Italy is one of the ones. Uh, is anyone here from Italy? That's a pity. We'd like to have Italy on, on this. There it is. OK, well. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. It's really, um, so, What is achieved? The, the few lessons that have come out for this, first one is we can do this sort of thing. This is focused on, on working across the wikis, um, producing a report, dealing with anomalies, just on deaths. We broadened it actually from, uh, from deaths to uh, death categories. So there's a bunch of people where, that have, have, where things have been fixed where they were living, but they're over 150 years old, um, and most of those will tend to be anomalies. Um, the, uh, so it, it could be, the same technology could be extended to certain other things. Um, the wikis are developing their own rules and we're beginning to diverge a bit. So, for example, on the English Wikipedia, um, we only, if we don't know otherwise, we only assume you're dead if you'd be the oldest person alive or if you'd be, be 115 years old. Um, there are other language Wikipedias which seem to assume it at about 100. So some of the anomalies that we still have are down to these differences between different Wikipedias. And, well, that just means that when we're doing these, these sorts of things across wikis, we've got to make sure that the 
the link is, is weak and flexible, and you accept that there are going to be some anomalies that continue because you've got differences on there. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that, from my own experience, once you've dealt with the backlog, once you've dealt with those hundreds, the daily report that comes in and gives you a bunch gives you actually a really very good, very good opportunity of meeting a bunch of newbies uh, who have made their first edit on a slightly traumatic basis probably because quite likely these are the grandchildren, etc., of the Olympic sports person who has just died. Um, but very often the, the anomalies that come up each day on the English one are the, the article has been edited. There isn't necessarily a reference. Well, the person may have died last night, sometimes literally, aren't they? Um, and it's very often it's a newbie, it's their first edit is to update that, so they haven't added a reference. They certainly haven't changed the category, otherwise it wouldn't appear in the report. Um, but they have actually changed the article to say that this person has, has died. So if you want an opportunity of, of, of meeting newbies, this is a good way of doing it. You just go in and clean up after them and welcome the ones that haven't been welcomed. So um, any questions um, and any volunteers to take this? Oh, and if we've got somebody from Norway here, is, is Jan Harald's? Maybe not. Okay. I know the Norwegians have also um, had a, a big result recently. They, they, they've got 90% of their backlog cleared in the six weeks or so since they got their first report, which is over 700 articles that have been improved on the Norwegian Wikipedia. So, any questions on this? Deathly hush. Any, any countries interested in introducing this? Sorry, there was a person over here and then a person in the back. Sounds. Mm -hmm. Any sound?
Certainly on English, sources do not have to be in English. But actually, quite often I've found when I go to the, the German or the Italian or, or whatever to <coughs> find this anomaly, and I check on the article there, and I check on the reference they've used, very often I find that they've actually used an English language reference in the other one. So I'm, I'm sort of yes, that. So say I go on to say uh, 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 find the reference there, how can I check if it actually does the correspondence Okay. I've used Google Translate and I've also got a bunch of anomalies on the English one where I I'm just freaked out by the sorry, sorry guys, I'm not freaked out by the characters. Um, I can hand it if I look at it and it's in the alphabet I'm, I'm comfortable with, then I will I will try. Uh, if I look at it and it's a completely different alphabet, it's moved the wrong way around and so on. I've I've tried a few times but I've given up sometimes. One of the things I've done is I've gone to the Wiki Project, um, Wiki Project Japan on English, Wiki Project Russia, um, and I've followed people um, like Reinhardt and like Kurt uh, who lives in Thailand, but he's actually an English speaker. Um, and I said, can you help us out here? There's, there's this particular, we've got an accumulation of, I think at the moment there's an accumulation of Russians on the English report. Um, and I've, I've enlisted volunteers who've gone off and Okay, thank you, Jonathan, for a really fascinating and uh, interesting project. And I'm sure uh, the expandability of uh, the idea that you have introduced goes along not only to death anomalies, but uh, in the future time to other kind of uh, uh, updated data. Um, okay, our next speaker, as you can see, is Elektra Pavli Pavlaki, sorry. And you'll be talking about uh, a revival of uh, the Greek Wikipedia, hopefully. Yeah, well, revival is a strong word, but still. <laughs> the attempted revival of the <laughs> Greek Wikipedia. No, you're making it worse, but anyway. <laughs> Well, hi, I'm Elektra. I'm from Greece, but I'm currently studying in uh, Amsterdam uh, in a new media master. Uh, so what I'm going to present here is uh, a short, well, not that short, uh, summary of my thesis, which is a report on uh, the development of the Greek language Wikipedia. So it's getting developed. <laughs> Uh, well, what I have to say is that uh, while I proclaim myself as a researcher, and I've studied a lot about Wikipedia, I've read many books, um, when it comes to editing itself, I'm quite a newbie, so this is my contribution page. As you can see, it's not very long, but I'm trying on it. I'm really trying not to be a researcher and become more a contributor. Um, and I would like to say that my title is kind of misleading, maybe that confused you a little bit, because uh, Wikipedia is not, a Greek language Wikipedia is not that small, it's an average, but then my title would sound a little bit, it would not be that catchy, you know, average Wikipedia's great expectations <laughs> would not be that catchy, so I had to do something. Uh, so, and there's the proof, uh, some Truth in Numbers is a movie, I don't know if you've seen it on Wikipedia, uh, I kind of stole the title, I hope that uh, they forgive me. Uh, so the Greek language Wikipedia was founded in 2002. Uh, it currently has 63,700 plus one articles. That was the last night I checked it. Uh, I don't know now. Uh, Two million page views, July 2011. 86,595 registered users but 40 to 45 highly active editors. So what we see here is that um, the numbers are not quite, I mean, you can see that there, there is a quite significant number of people reading Wikipedia, visiting Wikipedia, but you can see there's a, a significantly smaller number 
editing Wikipedia, and not to mention the highly active editors, which are uh, quite small core community. So we could talk about inequality of participation and the slow pace of development, uh, especially when we compare it with, um, with countries or uh, language editions that uh, have about the same speaking population as Greece or even less. Uh, for example, Czech Wikipedia, you can see it has uh, almost 200,000 articles. Uh, the Swedish one, the Dutch one, the Catalan one. So yes, well, we are a little bit behind, I guess. There are many reasons for that, but I don't think I have time to elaborate on it. Maybe later. Uh, so every, every community uh, gets really creative when it tries to get big and stronger. So what uh, the community of the Greek language Wikipedia came up with was a campaign. Uh, the I participate in Wikipedia campaign, which was uh, first presented in TEDx Athens in November this year, and the official launch was in January. Uh, means <laughs> I participate. Um, so here are the aims of the campaign. The main aim is to make Greek language Wikipedia truly useful in both daily life and education, which means in numbers, again, that we have to reach the critical mass. Uh, which is over 100 articles, and just to make it more symbolic, we used to, uh, we'd like to, to, to mention 120,000 entries so that it sounds uh, bigger, I guess. Uh, what does that mean? To enrich the Greek language Wikipedia, to develop the encyclopedic culture, to sensitize the broader public, and, of course, to attract new editors, which is a virtuous cycle, one brings another. How are we going to do that? Experiential workshops and presentations. Where? Across Greece. I guess that's not very specific. So uh, uh, it's at libraries, schools, universities, conferences, associations, wherever we are invited. Uh, what, what is the audience we address to? Teachers, librarians, academics, students, broader audience. Again, whoever is interested in listening to us. This is a map of the workshops that have already taken place all over Greece. Uh, for now, it's 32 workshops. As you can see, they're pretty distributed all over the map. Well, most of them are in Athens, of course. Uh, more than 600 participants have already attended the workshops. Uh, with the yellow color, or whatever this color is, uh, it's just presentations because there was no uh, infrastructure for, uh, there was no computer room, for example. The white colors are the workshops and presentations, and the red one is the very first workshop that took place. So this is what a structure, uh, the structure for workshop would look like. I mean, this would be the ideal structure because most of the most of the time, some of the goals did, did not get completed, of course. Uh, so it was like a tutorial uh, teaching people how to edit Wikipedia, but also introducing them first to introduce them to the concept, uh, to inform them on the campaign, to navigate them on the main page, uh, to, to edit, uh, teach them the formatting tricks, for example. Um, teach them what it is, the discussion page, uh, new entry creation, which was the hardest part, I think. Uh, and because many of uh, the attendees were uh, teachers, uh, there was also a part uh, for how Wikipedia could be used in classroom. So why did they choose experiential workshops instead of, for example, the pretty known banners on Wikipedia or other type of internet campaign? to train participants through hands-on practice, to meet face-to-face -face and interact, which is all, it was also very interesting, actually. Um, as Jimmy Wells quoted yesterday, you should not be afraid to be human. So that's what Greeks did before Jimmy Wells <laughs> even thought about it, imagine that. Uh, so, and the third reason is to make the campaign viral. It's the easiest way to gather people it's the most probable that they will ask you, so where did you go in a workshop? What was the workshop about, et cetera, et cetera. So we did have allies in this attempt. We are not all alone. Uh, actually, we did have strong allies. Uh, the Ministry of Education, uh, 
I'm not saying the whole title, that's the summary. Uh, Greek Free Open Source Software Society, which is a non-profit organization. Uh, Greek Research and Technology Network, which is a state-owned um, organization. It, uh, what did they do? The Ministry of Education actually um, proclaimed 2011 as the year of digital encyclopedia, which was really useful because teachers felt that they had now the green light to use the encyclopedia without being semi-outlaw. Uh, uh, what they did also is that they incorporated the campaign as part of their digital strategy. And another one that was also revealing was that they tried to link electronic textbooks with Wikipedia, which came up with a very long list with, with, very long list with red links. Uh, well, the other organizations that gave us money uh, had the connections with uh, the libraries, the schools, etc. And of course, they provided, they funded the workshop material. Uh, in the middle, you can see there was a concise guide for beginners, which was written by a teacher in uh, the island of Kefalonia, which was distributed in all the workshops. Um, and the cookies, I must mention, they was really useful. So. Here am I. Uh, what was my mission? To follow the workshop, to observe and participate, to take interviews from the mentors, and to follow the digital traces, by which I mean I followed the discussions in the Agora. This is our village pump. This is uh, how it's called in the Greek language, language Wikipedia. Uh, pretty interesting debates. So, my general findings. Um, the audience. Oh my, there is an edit button. So that was, I think, the most revealing finding for me because I was kind of shocked. They, uh, when we first asked them, everybody said, yeah, I'm a pretty heavy user of Wikipedia, especially the students were, uh, come on, who are you to talk to me about Wikipedia? I, I copy paste all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so when I asked them, so uh, let's edit the article. Mm. Where is the edit button? They had never noticed the edit button. There was also a video that was talking about that, uh, the blindness that comes up when it comes to the edit button. So uh, the next question was also revealing because who edits Wikipedia? These are the answers that they gave us. Journalists, academics, writers, experts, and people who write encyclopedias. I don't know who they are. <laughs> ah, technical issues. Um, how long do I have to wait for my entry to be published? And that is my favorite one. I saved my entry, but I can't find where. It's not on the desktop. <laughs> so uh, Wikipedia in education. Uh, what I noticed is that teachers were really eager to bring Wikipedia in classroom. I mean, teachers in secondary education. Uh, academics, are, mm, they were not that eager. You can see a quote. Uh, credibility is what makes an encyclopedia an encyclopedia. Wikipedia is not an encyclopedia. It's a virtual space where anyone can write about anything. On the other hand, uh, this year uh, a PhD candidate launched Wiki University projects. So this is a first attempt and he's planning to, um, to expand it to other universities as well, but he is now working on his results so I can't reveal anything yet. Um, ah. When, we, when participants were asked to create an entry, the fir their first reaction was, but I have nothing to write about. And the next reaction was, okay, you have to write some about something. Okay, I'll write about my village, my school, my neighborhood, whatever was familiar to them. Uh, which is kind of good. I mean, this is the first step usually people take to start editing about other articles. But in Greek Wikipedia, we have a really strong trend in Greek centrism. As you can see, there is a survey run by, uh, by user uh, S. Cruz, I don't know what S means, uh, back in 2007, where he randomly selected 2,200 articles, and you can see the, white, the light yellow color is the, the percentage with the Greek centered themes, which is 40%. Uh, there was another survey, but that I think I don't have another. I don't have time to elaborate on that, uh, but the percentage is growing. Uh, and biting hurts. Uh, because people did actually try to edit, but they did try to edit, as I said, my village, my school, my neighborhood. Uh, I got deleted by the same user. Now it's getting personal. 
I don't mind they deleted my article, but why didn't they give any feedback? Mm. This is a word cloud that I made. I categorized kind of the questions that I heard all over the workshops. Uh, so as you can see, the main concern was credibility. Many questions on credibility. Uh, and the next question, which uh, I didn't expect it, I must say, was monitoring. So who reviews our articles? Is there an editorial team? And stuff like that. Neutrality was the least one referred. I don't know why, actually. And citation, because uh, there were many uh, teachers in the audience, classroom and citation were um, pretty often mentioned. So what are the pros and cons of the campaign? Um, I think the community got a clear picture of future editors and the problems that there are. Um, it got access to a broader public. There was a slight change of attitude, uh, which means that experienced editors realized that, remembered that once they were new editors, so they had to be, they didn't have to be that strict on the new editors, or at least they had to explain why they deleted the, the entry. And we are a Wikipedia trendy, because uh, we follow the trends, public, po uh, public policy initiative, uh, and we try to attract new editors. So these are both in the strategy plan of Wikimedia, as we saw yesterday. And the cons, um, few editors participated in the campaign. Uh, that is because some of them did not, did not agree with the idea of the campaign. Some of them did not know they could participate, and some of them did not want any new editors. It's our Wikipedia, you know. <laughs> Uh, and the second is that still it's running now six months. We don't have any breathtaking results like, wow, new entries or stuff like that. But it's still in an experimental phase, as they say. So I, I must give them some time and see. Um, and there are two that I don't know if there are pros or cons because I heard both sides. Uh, collaboration with institutions. Um, on one hand, as I said, they gave the green light so that uh, more teachers participated. But on the other hand, there was a fragile balance. Who is going to be the spokesperson of Wikipedia? Well, what are the roles of each part? Uh, and the meetings in person, some of the editors told me that, yeah, it was really nice that I met the people behind the usernames. Uh, but others told me that it's a, since the community is that small, it's really, really, really risky that um, if you know the other, it's harder to resist or to attack or to delete his article. Uh, these are the recommendations of a newbie. Uh, let's make a campaign for the campaign. Uh, maybe it's my advertising background that I see all over by, uh, campaigns, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's a good idea to raise campaign awareness among the editors. Uh, to overcome the objections, to attract more editors to, to participate. Uh, that would be a good idea to promote the support initiatives taken by members of the community that don't even participate in the campaign. Uh, or by encouraging newbies and experienced editors that participate in the workshops to share their experiences. Let's keep some local and take some global. Well, I, I guess Wikipedia is the best platform to you can harness its power to promote uh, the cultural richness because the uh, web is not neutral. It, it, it reflects the culture of its country. But still, maybe it's a good idea we encourage Greek Wikipedias to write for non-Greek centered topics. Let's be bold and experiment. It's something that uh, mentors uh, taught almost in every workshop. Don't be afraid, edit. In Wikipedia, nothing is irreversible. So why don't we try out new ideas that could be later implemented globally? And this is a quote uh, from the coordinator of the campaign. A great idea is that the Greek language Wikipedia can function as a testing ground for new ideas. And that's it. Um, 
that have participated. Uh, well, there were, in general, they didn't participate, most of them. But when they did, mo it was in the English one. Well, we were just checking, uh, there is also the bureaucrat of the Greek language Wikipedia here in the audience. So we were just checking uh, the percentages uh, shortly before we get in uh, the room. And uh, actually 79% read English Wikipedia. So that's a huge percentage. I mean. Yeah, I don't know what, uh, what there's still that you have to offer them something, you know, that they leave the, the safe place. I mean, uh, it's uh, because there is a problem with the Greek people. We learn many foreign languages, and that's a reason that they don't participate in the Greek language Wikipedia, because they can speak most of them fluently English, so they can write in the English Wikipedia. So many of them speak Spanish, so they can edit in the Spanish one, German, and stuff like that. So it's we get distributed, uh, we distribute our knowledge everywhere, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah? Greek religion, you said? Greekish. Ah, Greekish. Uh, no. Well, as I said, I'm a newbie, and I'm not uh, the right person to ask about that, but I've never heard of people writing in Greekish. What do you say? Yeah, I don't think it's a common problem. That's what they said, that it's a good start, but we yeah. have to push them yeah. to well, do... The thing is, um, if, you, if you want to, to motivate people and get people to hold things, the, the whole plan approach of working with museums is a great thing for that. And we've got one or two opportunities to cooperate between Britain and uh, uh, Greece. We've cooperated with the, the Indians and so on about stuff in British museums. There are one or two things in British museums that uh, Greece <laughs> might be interested in. <laughs> One or two things, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the thing is that uh, it's the Greek centrism that we have to <coughs> pay attention to. That's the my that's my point. I know that it's a good start. That it's it's the best thing to write about something you feel familiar about. But first of all, most of the villages are not notable enough because there are no sources to support. For example, yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we won't be able to take further questions now, but uh, we do have another s session about increasing the participants in Wikipedia uh, right after this one. Uh, I could even tell you where it should take place, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, we'll look later on in the um, schedule. Our next speaker, uh, thank you very much, Electra, sorry. Uh, our next speaker. is uh, Josh Lim, who should be speaking about language policies on the Tagalog Wikipedia. I'm sorry for taking uh, several minutes of your precious time, but uh, okay. the stage is yours. Thank you. I should warn you um, and everyone watching here today that this is arguably the longest presentation at Wikimania. This is 55 slides long. So I will be breezing through some of them, but don't worry, the presentation is designed in such a way where no slide should take no more than 20 seconds on the screen. Uh, I could, just in case. Um, but the title of this presentation is May Kalagitnaan Ba Ang Wika? Isang Pagsusuri ng Mga Patakarang Pangwika ng Wikipedia ng Wikipedia Tagalog. In English, it's known as Is There a Middle Ground to Language? An Analysis of the Tagalog Wikipedia's Language Policies Presented by Wikipedia Philippines 
um, largely um, by the four people that you see there on the screen, myself, James Joshua Lim, Joseph F. Ballesteros, who's over here, the president of Wikimedia Philippines, Eugene Alvin Villar, who is somewhere here in the present day, um, in Wikimania, and Frederick A. Kaleka, who is currently in the Philippines. And if you read the Wikipedia blog, has just been blogged about recently as part of the Wiki Histories Fellowship. This is um, the Wiki. This is what the um, what we call the Wikipedia Tambayan Talk. We met with officials here on the right from the Commission sa Wikang Filipino, also known as the Commission on the Filipino Language, where we coordinated with them on the implementation of the Tagalog Wikipedia's language policies. Precisely because the language policies in themselves are very controversial and have elicited many complaints and many comments over the last few years. But we'll tell you the secrets, I guess, to the longevity of the policies as well as whether or not the policies have had any discernible impact on how the Tagalog Wikipedia is viewed. But first, let's begin on the background of the Tagalog Wikipedia. Let's have some fast facts. The Tagalog Wikipedia was founded in December 2003. We didn't know the exact date, but according to the Internet Archive, the first ed, the, the page came up on November 30, 2003, at least U.S. time. In the Philippines, that means it's December 1, 2003, and we finally settled on that date for the Wikipedia 10 celebration. The Tagalog Wikipedia currently has about 53,000 articles and per the decision of the Wikimedia Foundation's Language Committee on several occasions because there have been proposals for a Filipino Wikipedia which I will talk about later as well as the Tagalog Wikipedia community itself, Tagalog and Filipino, also known as the national language of the Philippines, are considered to be the same language because there is no real difference between them and that will be discussed later on although they are legally different. Different. Although it has only the second largest number of articles, the Tagalog Wikipedia plays a de facto role as the largest Philippine Wikipedia project. It has the most number of page views at almost 11,000 page views an hour. Compare that to the second largest Wikipedia in terms of speakers, the Cebuano Wikipedia only gets one-tenth of the number of page views the Tagalog Wikipedia gets. It has the biggest reach of speakers at over 90 million people and the Philippine population is expected to reach 100 million this year. And it has the highest level of depth among all of the Philippine language Wikipedias with a depth of 18. Although they say that depth is not really a measure anymore of how quality a Wikipedia is. However, I'd like to tell you now that language of the Tagalog Wikipedia did not have an easy history. And this is because of the many debates that have taken place in the Philippines, both politically and non-politically, over the use of language and the role of the Philippine languages in everyday life and in academia. So let me now go on to the second part of this presentation, which is a history of Tagalog and Filipino as the basis of the new national language. In the Philippine Constitution, it says that the national language of the Philippines is Filipino. As it evolves, it shall be further developed and enriched on the basis of existing Philippine and other languages and subject to the provisions of law. And as the Congress may deem appropriate, the government shall take steps to initiate and sustain the use of Filipino as a medium of official communication and as a language of instruction in the educational system. The regulator of Filipino is the Commission sa Wikang Filipino. However, criticism has come, of, has come by the KWF saying that it does not really do its job. But we have to analyze why the KWF doesn't do its job and how does this reflect on the Tagalog Wikipedia. Remember that, as I mentioned earlier, there have been several debates as to how the national language has been formed. And it begins here with here with the national language has always been part and parcel of the debate over national identity. What was to be the national language has been debated for the last 80 years and continues to be debated today and will probably continue to be debated in the years to come. It begins with this man named Wenceslao Vinzons. He is a Filipino congressman born in Indan, Camarines Norte, which is a province south of Manila. It's about 400 kilometers south of Manila. 
He was known as a student leader, an advocate for the unification of Malay-speaking Southeast Asia, and a supporter of Philippine independence from the United States. At the age of 24, Vinzons became the youngest member of the Philippine Constitutional Convention, which drafted the 1935 Philippine Constitution, which was supported by the United States. His greatest contribution, however, is Article 14, Section 3 of the 1935 Constitution, which laid the groundwork for the establishment of a Philippine national language. That's this text. The Congress shall take steps toward the development and adoption of a common national language based on one of the existing nation native languages and otherwise provided by law, English and Spanish shall, be con shall continue to be the official languages. However, that is not the original text as supported by Vinzons and the members of the Constitutional Committee, um, Constitutional Convention. This is the original text. If you compare it to the other text that I showed you earlier, you'd see that instead of based on one existing language, it says based on existing native dialects. This was because the text was changed as the draft constitution made it to the Committee on Style of the Constitutional Convention, which was tasked to finalize the document. This was done ostensibly under the influence of the man revered today in the Philippines as the Ama ng Wikang Pambansa, also known as the father of the national language. That's this man, Manuel El Quezon, also known as the second president of the Philippines and the first president of the Philippine Commonwealth. Manuel El Quezon was a staunch advocate of the creation of a Philippine national language. He constituted the Surian ng Wikang Pambansa or the National Language Institute in 1937, the forerunner of today's KWF, which pursuant to the 1935 constitution eventually concluded that the new national language should be based on Tagalog. But of course, now we have to deal with the debate from Tagalog to Filipino, fact, fiction, or both, or basically whether or not Filipino really exists as a separate language. As you can see in this photo, you have lots of English Filipino dictionaries. But in the Philippines, you have English Filipino dictionaries, you have English Filipino dictionaries of a P. Legally, Filipino and Filipino are different languages. And you have English and Tagalog dictionaries all of which supposedly are the same. And in fact, one of the most authoritative dictionaries in the Philippines is a dictionary by Father Leo James English, which is a Tagalog dictionary. Treated the same way as, let's say, the UP Dictionaryong Filipino, seen to be the most authoritative Filipino language dictionary, is seen. The debate on whether or not the Tagalog Wikipedia should be called the Filipino Wikipedia, or whether or not the language used on the Tagalog Wikipedia is also considered to be Filipino, finds its roots in the 1960s when considerable efforts were made to begin differentiating the two. Now, for example, if you look at this text, this text in English basically says there is an electronic device invented by a Filipino which will fix the way people sleep, for those who lack sleep or cannot sleep, which will be introduced to the public. Now, Ponciano B.P. Pineda, who is a linguist associated with the Surian ng Wikang Pambansa in the 1960s, um, published a study for the National Language Institute, gives examples of how Filipino, following Vinzon's prescription, may have turned out to be vis-a-vis -vis the existing status quo. It turns out to be very different from the previous text. So here you see, here you'll see a mix of different languages. Where today Filipino is commonly seen to be Tagalog-based, here you'll see words like metung from Kapampangan. You'll see um, use such as agbayag, which is from Ilocano, mointrodusir, which is from Cebuano, panagturog, which is from a Visayan language, I believe it is Ilocano, and magapanormal, which is a construction from Bicol. Those are languages of Wikipedias, by the way. The universal approach, was the, that text is called, embraces what is called the universal approach. The universal approach has been embraced by linguists in the Philippines on the presumption that it makes language development less elitist and Tagalocentric. Quoting here from um, Dr. Yabes, who published a book in 1977, Leopoldo Yabes, by the way, he says he, Cecilio Lopez, a prominent Filipino linguist, said that before, before until 1963, his method of language development was elitist, which aimed to form a national language to be based on only one, on only one language, which in this case is Tagalog. This changed after 1963 as a result of many newly discovered ways of language development. He saw what could be the solution to all our problems with the national language and referred to the national approach. And that problem actually is this problem. This is Manila. And the language problem in the 60s came about because an Ilongo group 
complained that the national language did not represent all the native dialects of the Philippines. Eventually, the fight, what was originally the fight of the Ilongos, became a fight of the Cebuanos. And today, in the Philippines, Cebu, the, the government of the province of Cebu, which is located some 500 kilometers south of Manila, mandates that all public school children in the province of Cebu must sing the national anthem of the Philippines, not in Filipino, as it is mandated by the law, but in Cebuano, as a form of linguistic protest. The reason why you see Manila here is because because of a phenomenon called Imperial Manila, where people in the provinces claim that, you know, the Philippines is Manila and they feel left out. Yes. With what? Well, if you think about it here, has trying to improve, that's about, that's already the next portion, don't worry. Has, uh, yes. Uh, Um, not just that. It's also the language that we use in the Tagalog Wikipedia. Yes, exactly. What kind of words you use, the way that we write, so on and so forth. So that's the question that we've all been trying to answer as trying to avoid Imperial Manila impeded the growth of Tagalog and other Philippine languages. That's what the language policies are for. Because there are three linguistic challenges which impede the growth of the Tagalog Wikipedia. You have the prevalence of Taglish, which is Tagalog mixed with English, and it is very popular, believe me. And the concept of deep language, the lack of intellectualization of the language, because they are, the common complaint is that Filipino lacks scientific vocabulary, lacks mathematical vocabulary, therefore we frequently rely on English or constructions just so we can enrich the scientific vocabulary of Filipino. And of course, the government's official promotion of English. Rolando Estinio, in his book, um, A Matter of Language or English Falls, writes that deep language, and it's a popular construction in the Philippines, the language is deep. When you start speaking in Philippine, in Tagalog or in Filipino, that, you know, the words are in the language, but people do not know them, they say you are speaking so-called deep language. So, for example, if I start saying, um, Sinturong Pangkaligtasan, which means seatbelt in Filipino, they automatically associate it with deep language because in the Philippines, no one uses Sinturong Pangkaligtasan. Everyone says seatbelt. And so, it's a malapropism invented by so-called linguistic idiots to express their thoughts in language, either too serious or too complex to be understood. And what happened basically is that now, the problem in the Philippines is that the use of language is so anarchical that everyone tends to forget that language is classified. So essentially, you have people speaking in Taglish, which is supposedly a colloquial form of Tagalog or Filipino, and they use it in their academic papers, in academic discourse. A problem of the Tagalog Wikipedia is that we frequently encounter articles written in Taglish in comparison to articles being written in Greeklish, for example, simply because a lot of the terms being used in, the Taga uh, in Tagalog are no longer being used in common discourse. And so it's Taglish is a manifestation of deep language where English is used instead of native terms. Consequently, the native terms die and are fallen out of use because the terms are no longer used. You, um, the second problem now is lack of intellectualization. You have this man, he is um, Senator Manuel Lito Lapin, where you have this phenomenon where you know your ATM machines are only in English or in Taglish. You don't have an ATM in English or Filipino. Because in 2004, Senator Lapid files a bill mandating the use of Filipino in business transactions. Vetoed by the President of the Philippines at the time, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, because Filipino supposedly has terms which are not fit for public consumption. As to what not fit for public consumption is, we do not know. And to this day, she hasn't been able to answer that even if all the court cases being thrown against her. And lastly, there have been moves by government officials to promote English often at the expense of the native languages. You have this man named Eduardo Gulias, who is a representative from the province of Cebu, as I mentioned earlier. He has filed bills repetitively, it's called the Gulias Bill, where in a bid to increase the competitiveness of the Philippines, English should be the language of me, uh, the medium of instruction. It's opposed by pro-Filipino groups because they claim that it, it, it 
unfairly adva- it unfairly places an advantage in English at the expense of the native languages. And therefore, when you want to use a computer in Filipino, it's impossible because the government does not support the policy of intellectualizing Filipino. If any of you have seen the Filipino language pack for Windows 7, believe me, when you install it in your computers, it is absolutely horrendous. You will see terms mixed with English, you will see Filipino terms, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So what has the Tagalog Wikipedia done to address these three issues? We have passed language policies to ensure that we use proper Filipino or Tagalog in the, in the articles that we write. The Tagalog Wikipedia's language policies revolve around the trifecta of translation, standard borrowing, and standard spelling, all revolving around the official orthography passed by the Commission sa Wikang Filipino. Something that a lot of Filipino language users tend to ignore because, you know, we grow up with what our language teachers have taught us. The language policies, therefore, of the Tagalog Wikipedia seek to balance the two extremes of Tagalog and Filipino language development. Purism, which is, you know, you can invent terms to create new words which are not expressed in Tagalog. Or universalism, which borrows heavily from other languages, especially English, by establishing a tangible, concrete middle ground. These are the policies. Yes, I understand that they're in Filipino. But in summary form, basically it is use the Tagalog term if the Tagalog term exists and try to know the Tagalog term as much as possible. If the term does not exist, then you can begin borrowing. Try, um, if you cannot find, if the borrowing is wrong, other Wikipedians will correct it for you. Use Tagalog, Filipino, and Filipino dictionaries. If there are no equivalents in Tagalog, you may borrow from other Philippine languages as is the standard for the Commission sa Wikang Filipino. And you can try to translate it in Filipino, Tagalog, if it's still possible. But if, when it comes to Tagalization, make sure that you use the orthography prescribed by the Commission sa Wikang Filipino. Use references when you find unknown words that you want to introduce into the Tagalog Wikipedia and you can use a wide variety of texts including the Bible which they say is one of the most authoritative Tagalog language texts out there. And you may ask for help from Wikipedians and then um, you go ahead and <clears throat> excuse me, try to use interwikis, so on and so forth. This is different, however, from the approach of other Wikipedias that have taken in terms of determining what form of language ought to be used in writing articles. There are Wikipedias with language policies. For example, the Latin Wikipedia says that if there are terms which are based on Latin, try to Latinize them. I believe like a car hood has been Latinized. I don't remember what the term is exactly. It's on the Wikipedia article. But there are no Wikipedias, as far as we know, that have language policies as extensive as that of the Tagalog Wikipedia. Uh, of the Tagalog Wikipedia. Simply because we want to avoid this problem. On the left, you have what they call Tagalog in common parlance. On the right, you have Taglish or to many linguists, Filipino. You can see that we have, an, we have a Filipino term for the, for the River Thames. It's the Ilog Tamesis, borrowed from Spanish. But no one uses Tamesis anymore. The last time someone encountered the term Tamesis was in a, was in a book published in 1879. And so everyone now uses the word Thames. No one has encountered Londres, the name for London, also borrowed from Spanish. Everyone uses London. If you watch newscasts that involve the UK as a subject, of the news of a news article, everyone says London, London, London instead of Londres, so on and so forth. But it begs the question: Is information better delivered using formal or informal styles of writing and speech? During the Wiki Histories Fellowship, we were informed by um, the fellow who int- who is doing the. Tagalog Wikipedia for her research, Meredith Artalusan, that in the Hindi Wikipedia, for example, the Indians who are currently watching this can correct me. For example, the language used is informal, where even English, mixed Hindi English, is accepted in writing articles. Is that correct? <laughs> I'll be sure to ask them, but that's what I was told. Um, in the Tagalog Wikipedia, a pressing question is what is formal and what is informal. The standard definition that I can probably give you is that in for- formal language is not Taglish. Because everyone thinks that Taglish is something that you use on the street. And when you encounter more um, deeper terms, going back to Tino's definition of deep language, it's supposedly formal Filipino. 
But some say, however, that the language policies of the Tagalog Wikipedia do not help in disseminating free knowledge because the language used does not keep up with what the audience uses. In fact, the common complaint with the former Filipino and then Tagalog as the basis for the national language was that in the 1940s, the way language was taught was very grammatical and very rigid. Which, which elicited a lot of complaints even from native Tagalog speakers because then they found out that, you know, if I can learn my language on the street, now I cannot because I have to listen to my language teacher, which I obviously do not want to do. So, if, so it begs the question, eventually, do we have to have a Wikipedia or should the Tagalog Wikipedia's contents be written like this? This is an example of Taglish, you know, nakakalungkot isipin na narealize lang natin kung gaano kaganda ang kayamanan ng wikang Filipino sa tuwing sasapit ang linggo ng wika. That we realize, you know, how beautiful the Filipino language is only during National Language Month. And in fact, um, there is an entire month dedicated to that because you're supposed to uh, elicit pride in the national language of the Philippines. But you can see here that there is a lot of, there are taglish terms that are interspersed here. Um, these terms, you know, some of these terms have Tagalog equivalents, which are not used in colloquial speech. But some, they're not even being used in academic speech as well. But you know, if we want to push it to an extreme, we could do it like this. This is Jeje speak, or you know, the Jejemon phenomenon, where people, yes, write and type like this. So eventually, I won't be surprised, you know, to put it pejoratively, that someday we will have Filipinos write like this. But, huh? Yes, like lead speak. Um, and this is a very popular phenomenon because, you know, people like writing their texts like this. I mean, I'm having a very difficult time reading what this says, but eventually I won't be surprised that this text, this type of language will come out in Philippine language discourse because it's simply that popular. So, but we, however, we believe that there is anecdotal evidence that suggests that Filipino Wikipedians are afraid to touch the Tagalog Wikipedia because they feel that their command of Tagalog is not up to the par of the project. We have Filipino Wikipedians who say, no matter how many times we encourage them to join the Tagalog Wikipedia and improve articles in the Tagalog Wikipedia, they say, ah, my Tagalog or Filipino is not good enough. Ah, my Filipino is only good for comedic use. Therefore, they don't want to edit, but they try to edit anyway. And you know, we're always there to help them. So going on to conclude the impact of the Tagalog Wikipedia's language policies, there is anecdotal evidence that terms used and or preserved by the Tagalog Wikipedia are beginning to enter the mainstream. Based on Google searches that I have conducted just this morning, because I only finished the presentation this morning, terms like sinturong pangkaligtasan, which means seatbelt, Teleponong celular or mobile phone and talumpati sa kalagayan ng bansa, also known as the State of the Nation Address, similar to the speech of the throne of the Queen in the United Kingdom and the State of the Union Address in the United States, have more than 100,000 Google hits. And you will see texts, for example, that use talumpati sa kalagayan ng bansa. In fact, I encountered an article written by Amnesty International which incorporates that term. But you know, in the Philippines, everybody says SONA. However, there has been no significant impact on readership and editing with the language policies in place. However, editor quality is declining and the community is composed of only a handful of core editors. We cannot really say that that's the result of the language policies. However, we can say that that is something that for us in Wikimedia Philippines, that is something for us to touch upon because we believe that in order for us to shore up the quality of the, of the Philippine language Wikipedias, we need people and we currently lack people. However, we hope to establish a link on whether or not the Tagalog Wikipedia's language policies really affect the number of people who actively edit the project. For more information on this, this is my paper, Anita Want the Calling, Fixing the Problems of Philippine Language Policy. It's available on Scribd. I will post the PowerPoint later on the wiki. And I hope that you'll be able to read it. And thank you for listening. I will now accept your questions. Uh, yes, thing. <laughs> there are eight Philippine languages. Unfortunately, most of the members of Wikimedia Philippines are based in Manila. But most of the Tagalog Wikipedians are members, of, the core group of Tagalog Wikipedians are members of the chapter. Jojit and I 
are bureaucrats on the Tagalog Wikipedia, for example, and we play the key role in the formation of these language policies. However, we find it interesting that part of our advocacy is ensuring the propagation and preservation of the Philippine languages. And so we have initiated discussion with the Commission Sa Wikang Filipino on the topic of the language policies and on how to better propagate knowledge in Tagalog. Similarly, we hope to do the same with the other Philippine languages. We are hoping to call language competitions within the next one to two years on the model of the Indonesian language writing competitions so that we can better improve access to knowledge in the Philippine languages. Our targets right now are Cebuano, Ilocano, and Kapampangan, if I'm not mistaken. There is a question here from Jayanta. Yes? Oh, sorry. I didn't see. Parang, sorry, it's malabo. It's, it's blurry, so yes. There are there are dictionaries in Tagalog and there are and we advertise a lot to the editing community that they should edit the Tagalog Wikipedia and likewise we do a lot of promotion on social media to encourage people to contribute what they know in the Philippine language Wikipedia. So there's a question here, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. so what you see is their involvement. And we are also a very rich and traditional history located in the Philippines. There's a large number of uh, Tagalog and Filipino speakers outside of the Philippines. Are they involved in this? Or they, they have a, a stand? The the coincidental thing there is actually there are only pl the three places where there are more than one million Filipino speakers. It's the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. There are 31,000 Filipinos in Israel, 6,000 in the city of Haifa. And I see a lot of them for some reason every day when I go out. However, yes, yes just, the, just yesterday I encountered a Filipino going to the post office. But to answer your question, Incidentally, we only have one core Tagalog Wikipedia editor based outside the Philippines. And a lot of the Filipino Wikipedians who edit the Wikipedia projects from outside the Philippines are like the majority of Filipino Wikipedians. They edit the English Wikipedia. And a lot of them, and some of them in fact, are raised in households where Tagalog or Filipino is not the first language. In Hawaii, the first language of the majority of Filipinos there is actually Ilocano. So when you see someone holding a sign, you're from the Philippines, you see a sign saying, I speak Ilocano, and you try to talk to them in Tagalog, they will look, to you dumbfound they will look at you dumbfoundedly because, you know, we can't presume that everyone speaks Tagalog. So um, there isn't really a lot of involvement, but we hope to see more involvement from the Filipino, from the Filipino communities located outside of the Philippines, especially when it comes to language development. And so thank you for listening my, to my presentation. Yes, and I hope you don't all get mad at me for wearing a Captain America shirt on a Philippine presentation. <laughs> thank you. You can take it. Uh, thank you, Josh. Um, I think uh, one important um, um, conclusion that we are taking from your talk as well as, as from the earlier talks is the influence of our uh, Wikip Wikipedia editors on reality itself, on um, if we are talking about endangered languages or languages which are not always uh, used as a primary language for technical uh, uh, terms, for scientific terms, here we see how, thanks to Wikipedia, languages like Hebrew, like Judeo-Spanic, like uh, Tagalog, are incorporating into them uh, the proper, the accurate uh, local uh, technical uh, terminology. Uh, which is more native and more uh, straightforward for uh, local native speakers. Um, if you're interested in the talks that we have just heard, then you, you will probably be interested in another talk that is given tomorrow morning uh, by Mr. Hari Paras Parasad. Uh, Come here. We'll be having a discussion on uh, languages that use more than one writing system. So that will be tomorrow morning and at the multi-lingual uh, projects track. That's so at please Gilboa do attend. At, at Gilbao. So please do attend and uh, take part in the discussion. We'll be very happy to uh, take the discussion forward and see what can be done for these languages. Thank you. As for, uh, yeah.
As for increasing participation in Wikipedia projects, as we has have discussed here, it will take place right after this one in just a few minutes in the Rappaport Hall. So if it interests you, that's your next destination. Thank you all. <laughs>